Good afternoon, I'm Associate Professor Wendy Ingman. I run the Breast Biology and Cancer Unit at the Basil Hetzel Institute at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And today I'm going to be talking about that elusive topic of breast cancer prevention. And so first of all, before I talk about the research that my group is doing, I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem and really help you understand what, what breast cancer prevention is and what we need to do to get there. So first of all, just imagine this circle represents all the women in one year that are diagnosed with cancer in Australia, a new diagnosis of cancer. Now if we have a look at what type of cancers these usually are, two thirds of women diagnosed with cancer have cancer in one of four um, organs. The most common type of cancer is breast cancer. Breast cancer accounts for 28% of all cancer diagnoses in women in Australia. So then we have three other types of cancer which are also very common. Does anyone know what other types of cancer are common in women? Colon. Colon cancer? Yeah, so colorectal cancer. That's the second most common type of cancer. Ovarian? Ovarian cancer, no. Ovarian cancer isn't actually as common as, as the others. Lung? Lung cancer, yep. Yeah. Um, lung cancer and one more. Okay. Skin cancer, that's right. And so altogether these four make up about two thirds of all old cancer diagnoses in Australian women. So if we were to take skin cancer for example, what's the major risk factors for skin cancer? Exposure to sun. That's right, so exposure to sun. So if we want to prevent skin cancer, what we need to do is stop women from going out in the sun. So you're probably all aware of the public health messages about looking after your skin, wearing a hat when you're out in the sun, wearing sunscreen, all those sorts of things. And those approaches are going to be very effective in reducing the incidence of skin cancer in the future. So how about lung cancer? What's the major risk factors for lung cancer? Smoking, Smoking right. So how do you stop uh, lung cancer? You can dramatically reduce lung cancer by reducing the number of people that are smoking. And we, of course, have these public health messages to prevent us doing that as well. Colorectal cancer is mostly about the crap that we eat. So that's one of the big risk factors is our diet. And of course, there are also, not just for colorectal cancer, but for other health um, problems in general, a lot of public health messages about eating the right foods. OK, so now we have breast cancer. What is the major risk factor for breast cancer? What is the thing that makes breast cancer so common? Oh, that's right, having breasts. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> Being a woman is the, ma the largest single breast, uh, factor for breast cancer. So not really something that we can do much about in terms of a public health message. So what having breasts and being a woman is about is having exposure to these ovarian hormones, oestrogen and progesterone. And they're really the key hormones that are causing the risk of breast cancer that we have today. So if we can't um, prevent breast cancer with the public health messages that we can use to reduce the incidence of these other cancers, how do we then prevent breast cancer? So what we need to do is we need to get smart about it. We can't approach this from a public health perspective we need to understand more about the biology of the breast and why it is the organ in a woman's body that is so commonly susceptible to cancer. So what we need to do is figure out what I call the thing. And I'll write that in, I think I'll write that in red. And I've put it up here to show it is in capital letters, the thing. The thing 
is what makes women susceptible to cancer, breast cancer. And at the moment, what we know is that it's about the thing is being a woman, the thing is having exposure to oestrogen and progesterone. Those things are not going to help us prevent breast cancer. We need to understand how these hormones are acting on the breast to increase its susceptibility to cancer. That is the thing that we can then manipulate and control so that we can prevent women from getting breast cancer in the future. So to illustrate how important discovering what the thing is, I'm going to talk about a different type of cancer and how discovering the thing was absolutely critical in preventing that type of cancer. So does anybody recognise this gentleman? He uh, is actually quite a famous man. He developed a test which a lot of women in the audience probably have every two years. Oh. And actually this was this test was named after himself. What about this man? Does anyone recognise him? He is um, the man who discovered the thing for cervical cancer, which I'll talk about in a minute. But surely you do understand this, you, you do recognise this man? Fraser. Ian Fraser. That's right. And the story actually starts with a man who I couldn't even find a photo of. He's that famous. So this is actually um, a print of his book which uh, has been reproduced. So the story starts in Verona um, in the 19th century with this Italian doctor, Domenico Rigoni Stern. And he was a doctor working uh, in a village and he discovered that the incidence of cervical cancer in women was very closely linked with their sexual activity. So women who were nuns, who had no sexual activity at all, they didn't get cervical cancer. It was only the women that were married and um, having children and having sex who uh, developed cervical cancer. But that on its own doesn't really tell you very much. It's very difficult to understand where, where that would fit in. Why would having sex cause you to have increased risk of, of cervical cancer? So. This was really, um, on its own, uh, not very helpful for us a as scientists. And there was a lot of different theories going around about why it would be that sexual activity would be linked with cervical cancer. And it had also been noticed um, just uh, shortly afterwards that Jewish women tended to have a high um, protection against cervical cancer. They didn't seem to get cervical cancer so often. And so it started to be um, believed that the consumption of bacon was linked with cervical cancer. And this was actually one of the, the popular theories. And then this theory was superseded by another theory, which was that the exposure to foreskin was uh, somehow a protective effect. Uh, sorry, was a, um, was a stimulate or caused increased risk of cervical cancer. So those were the theories that were around at the time. And then uh, this man, Georgius Papanakalou, uh, very happy to say that his test got shortened to the pap smear. Uh, he noticed in 1924 that before women got cervical cancer, there were cellular changes in, their, in the cells in their cervix which preceded the cancer and could predict the women that were going to get the cancer. Now we didn't understand why those changes preceded cervical cancer, but he was, he was, this is what he was noticing in the clinic. And eventually the pap smear test was adopted and in the 1950s the use of this test reduced uh, the mortality rate from cervical cancer by 70%. So this test was, um, had an enormous impact on um, on the, the mortality due to cervical cancer. But still didn't understand what those cellular changes were, what was causing them, um, and why these women were then uh, having increased risk of cervical cancer. Now we have finally the man, Harold Zerhausen, who discovered the thing. And the thing didn't come out of the blue. Uh, there was a group of scientists that were starting to link the sexual activity, the um, increased number of, of sexual partners with increased risk of cervical cancer. 
starting to understand that cervical cancer was uh, something to do with a, a transmitted disease. And these researchers started to think of, um, of cervical cancer as being caused by a virus. And the first virus they started looking at was uh, genital warts. And then, so they were, on, they were on track to finding the thing. And then in 1985, Harold Zerhausen discovered that it was the human papilloma virus which was linked to cervical cancer. And all of a sudden, everything else makes sense. So now we have a virus that's sexually transmitted, which explains uh, why cervical cancer is linked with sexual activity. And it's the cellular changes that are caused by the virus which are what the pap smear test detects. Now that we knew what the thing was, it was only a matter of time before we could translate that into a preventative vaccine. And in fact, it was only six years later that Ian Fraser in 1991 announced that they had developed a vaccine against human papillomavirus. And then 15 years after that, after that vaccine had gone through all of its uh, uh, clinical tests and approvals, that vaccine was, um, was then ready for, for us to use. And, and this vaccine is going to now mean that the young girls today who are immunised will grow up in an environment which is free from cervical cancer. So from the time of the thing being discovered in 1985 to the vaccine just over 20 years later, that's how long it takes. Once we know what the thing is, it's a matter of time before we, we know how to prevent cervical cancer. Okay, so where are we with breast cancer prevention? Well, breast cancer prevention also has its own Italian doctor. Uh, back in the 18th century, Bernardino uh, Ramazzini, he was also a doctor working in Italy. He noticed that nuns had a very high risk of developing breast cancer. This is actually the opposite of what Rigoni Stern noticed um, in the next century. So clearly, breast cancer risk is not linked with uh, sexually transmitted virus, however, Having sex and having children seems to be protective against breast cancer. We also know one of the big risk factors now for breast cancer, which is breast density or mammographic density. This is the density that you see on a mammogram um, uh, when you go to, to have your, your screening test. This was first discovered by John Wolfe in 1976. It has taken up until the last five years for this um, risk factor to be properly acknowledged. So there was a lot of um, discussion amongst scientists of what the value of uh, breast density was in terms of predicting risk, because it was for a long time believed that if you have a high dense breast tissue, it's actually masking a tumour. So the tumour was already there, so it's not predicting a tumour. However, we finally, about five years ago, came to a consensus that breast density is in fact a very major risk factor for breast cancer and density does in fact precede um, breast cancer or it increases a woman's risk of breast cancer. So we don't understand yet what causes breast, ca breast density or why increased breast density actually causes a woman to have increased risk of breast cancer. So until we do, we're not going to know what the thing is. We don't understand why breast cancer uh, is linked with a lack of sexual activity and we don't understand why breast density is linked to breast cancer risk. So that's what we're waiting to discover. That's the thing that we need to figure out until we can move on to prevent breast cancer. Now, if you were to ask me, if I was to be giving this talk two years ago and you were to ask me, well, what is the thing? I would have no, I wouldn't be able to tell you. And we still don't know what the thing is, but we do have a few leads now, which is very exciting. And hopefully we are now on track to starting to understand what the thing is and how we can prevent breast cancer. So there's been a few labs around the world who have started to home in on how the immune system functions in the breast and how um, different types of different cells of the immune system are affecting how the breast functions 
and how it is being, uh, how breast cancer risk is being affected. And one of the cells that I've become interested in, and our lab is, has also been interested in, is macrophages. The macrophages are cells of the immune system, and most of the time their role is to uh, help to survey the tissue, to look for damaged cells that might be going on to develop cancer, and eliminate them. However, what we've found is that in the breast, these macrophages have other roles to play as well. They are also involved in the normal functioning of the breast to allow it to develop so that a woman could go on and, and feed her baby or um, go through puberty and those sorts of things. And we also have evidence that these same macrophages increase the density of breast tissue. So what we now think is that perhaps these macrophages, because they are involved in this normal functioning of the breast, their ability to survey a tissue and protect it against cancer is being compromised. And our lab has started looking at different types of macrophage functions and what macrophages are doing in the tissue. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail today, but what we've found is that if we can inhibit a particular pathway that macrophages use to promote their, their roles in the breast, if we can inhibit that pathway in a mouse model, we can actually reduce the breast cancer risk in that mouse model by fivefold. So we can induce five times less cancers when we inhibit this pathway. Now this is an experimental model at the moment. We haven't been able to yet translate this into humans, but if you can imagine, at the moment we have 13,000 women in Australia diagnosed every year with breast cancer. Imagine fivefold less of them. That's that's less than 3,000 women a year developing breast cancer, and that would be a, a wonderful if we could translate that. This work is in its very early preliminary stages, and we're hoping that we will be able to go through and be able to develop um, this as a, as a preventative measure. However, uh, we are still working um, very much in the experimental realm on that research. So, I would just like to um, introduce to you my lab. Uh, we work at the Basil Hetzel Institute at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and our logo here for the Breast Biology and Cancer Unit, which I head up, uh, was developed in, um, uh, with the assistance of the Hospital Research Foundation and I think it really nicely captures what our lab does. What we have is an older woman holding the hand of a young girl and what this symbolises is that the work that we do is not for our generation, it's actually for the next generation of young women growing up. And what we hope is that with this research and other research that's going on in breast cancer prevention, that these young girls will grow up in an environment where breast cancer is not the most common type of cancer in women. And that we have actually been able to develop a um, effective measure to reduce the breast cancer incidence and prevent breast cancer in the future. Thank you. And one of the ways you can help out is by donating to the Hospital Research Foundation. <laughs>